Okay, it's Matthew, uh, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 33. And it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures, treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one, no, no one can serve two masters, for, neither he, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Okay. We're in part three of our series called, e on, called Eternal Reward. And today I want to continue um, essentially the, the message that I started last week. And uh, so if you weren't here, don't worry, I'm going to give a quick recap and so um, let's let's do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to give this quick recap in part one. But uh, I'll do this. Let's get into today's message since I am tighter on time. Okay. Part one: seeking the consummation of earthly discipleship. Those are not my words. That's uh, C.S. Lewis, and uh, we'll return to that in just a second. Seeking the consummation of earthly discipleship. Part two. Um, Part two, the first rewards of generous stewardship. The first rewards of generous stewardship. I covered two of those last week. We'll quickly um, review those, and then I want to give you two more, right? And then I want to close by talking, and I want to ask you this question. I want to close this message by asking you to think about this question. Of what value are you? Of what value are you? Because so much of this, when we're talking about about, um, about you know, money and about stewardship is really the question of value. And that's why this message today is called Heavenly Valuation. Will you walk through your life thinking through heavenly valuation, divine valuation, not the earth's, not the world's? So let's get into it. So part one, I want to review, um, I want to take you to a quote. So last week, I had us wrestle with, um, with this question of, 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 of being a mercenary. And do you remember this question, this thing that I said? That there, for some people, there are transactional, um, transactional relationships, and then, then there's something called relational relationships. And in the scriptures, Jesus talks about where your heart is, that where your treasure will be also. And for so many of us, especially here in, in a place like Silicon Valley, we actually tend, our hearts tend to be in the money. <laughs> and then we want more earthly rewards and actually we look at relationships more for like the relationships we use people actually, you know, quite frankly, so that we can get more of the stuff. But then Jesus gives this very strange but incredible promise, which is don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth, but there's actually treasures in heaven where you can't lose it. You can't, it can't be stolen, it can't be rusted away, but you can't lose it. And then I, I opened up this question of, well, then if there's some kind of like money or reward in heaven, aren't we in, in a sense trying to be a mercenary? If we give here now, aren't, is that just another kind of like alternate way of being selfish? 
that really, okay, it's just a different kind of, of monetary award. Is there's going to be a heavenly one, and I'll, I guess I just want more heavenly money. Is that what we're interested in? And, um, and really what I wanted to do last week was to give you an answer for this issue, that Jesus, even though he is promising heavenly rewards, all heavenly rewards, I mean, he doesn't really care about, it's not, is money the, the biggest reward he wants to give you? He wants to give you an eternal reward, and money is not the biggest thing. Down here on earth, money may be a very, very big thing, but as I taught you two weeks ago, that, reason, that money is a spiritual matter because what we're talking about is what we deeply love and trust. We're talking about our treasure. And when the Lord calls you to handle your treasure in a certain way, it's a test of our hearts. Will your heart be toward Him? Will your heart be toward the things that are truly treasure in eternity? Or will your heart be toward the things that are like stuck here? And, um, and I gave you this lengthy quote and we went through this thing from C.S. Lewis on the weight of glory. And he really challenges us. He's saying, the real problem with us is he has this really famous portion that I, uh, um, where he says, the problem with us is not that our desires are too strong because we think our desires are so strong in relationship to money, but he actually says, our, our desires are too weak. Because what we tend to do is we're, we're like kids who'd rather play with you know, our mud pies because we don't know that there's a greater reward it's called like a day at the beach. And that's the way we are here on earth. We, we're just so fixated with earthly treasures and our earthly pleasures because we don't yet know there's something far bigger and greater. Now I want to take us to um, this quote, and uh, our brother can put that up now. And I want to close this on to review this portion. He said that, what you need to do is look for the day at the beach, not the mud pies that we're so you know, um, fixated upon. But then he gave us this little bit more complex example. He says, you know, he gave this example that when he was a boy, when he was a teenager, you had to study Greek. And at the beginning, there is a reward of studying Greek, and it comes intrinsically. It's like a consummation of studying Greek. So it's not like some other kind of like mercenary thing that's disconnected from the study of Greek. It's like a reward from the Greek itself. But he goes, at the beginning though, you don't really know that. He goes, like, you're like a kid and you have to study all this grammar and it's kind of just difficult and it's boring. And you don't really quite get it. But at the, in the future, you'll get to read the poetry. You'll get to read the classics and it'll like, it'll capture your heart and you get to read it in the Greek. And that is like the reward, which is the consummation from the, from the obedience itself. So this is how he puts it. The Christian, in relation to heaven, is in much the same position as the schoolboy. Those who have attained everlasting life in the vision of God doubtless know very well that is no mere bribe. It's not a bribe. God doesn't have to bribe you. There's a reward that comes from the obedience itself. But the very consummation of their earthly discipleship, the reward is the very consummation of your earthly discipleship. That's what he's saying. But we who have not yet attained it cannot know this in the same way and cannot even begin to know it at all except by continuing to obey and finding the first reward of our obedience in our increasing power to desire this bigger, more ultimate reward. So that's where we're at. Most of us are just, we're like kind of still in the Greek grammar stage. <laughs> and we can't, we haven't yet found out yet that there's a, a deep reward inside of the obeying. Our brother Glenn, he's tasted some of these rewards, right? Which is why we wanted you, and he's already seen, and he shared with things like, I, it made me less judgmental. It gave me big, bigger peace. He found out that generosity itself is its own great reward, Right? So he doesn't do it because he has to do it because he gets to do it. You get it? <laughs> and so those are some of the first rewards of, of, of being, of, of, the, of, of, of early earthly discipleship. And so what I want to do in part two now is to um, review two of the rewards that the, the, the Lord starts to give you now. We're not even talking about, I mean, just how incredible it's going to be when we are in, in the resurrected state and, and you know, in, the, in the New Jerusalem. But some of the rewards are now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review two that I gave you last week, and then I'm going to give you two more 
and then we'll close, um, we'll close with this question about value, okay? So part two, the first rewards of generous stewardship. So let's review. I gave you this verse, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. This is from Jesus. Give, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so this is the first. Let me just, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But first is, you know, this, this, uh, this way that Jesus is talking, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, that's the way it will be given to you. If that's the way you give, that's the way it will be given to you. And one of the things I want to teach you is, this is the heavenly economy. <laughs> this is the way it is in heaven. <laughs> in heaven, nobody's trying to hold out and, and then like they tell you lies and then you know, they give you a bait and switch. I mean, that's the way it happens on earth all the time. But nobody's doing that in heaven. In heaven, you have a need. They won't just feel the need. They'll just go good measure, pressing down, overflowing, they give it to you. And so do you want to know of what it's really like to be free in your heart? Begin to live like this now. <laughs> Begin to live like this now. And then you'll get to find out if your father in heaven goes, ah, oh, you get the heavenly economy. <laughs> so let me start giving it to you now. <laughs> so this is the first thing I want to, you want to, you want to find out what it's like? This is how, what it's like. And I gave you this other, uh, this practical piece of wisdom. Some of you want, it's like, why can't anybody be good to me? I mean, like our brother talked about, I was at this place in his career and he's like, because I'm getting a, like a little bit of the short end of the stick. You know, we all kind of have that. And we don't just do this at work. We do this with our friends. How come she's nicer to her, but not as nice to me? How come he's cooler to him, but not as cool to me? And we always wish we could just have better friends. But you know what? Instead of thinking of looking after A, number one, and looking for, you know, like looking at like how we don't get enough, and then we're resentful that somebody else seems to be getting more than us, which by the way is sin, it's like the sin of covetousness. Do not covet what somebody else is getting. Instead, why don't you do it this way? Hmm. Why don't you give more? And sometimes you're like, well, does that mean that person's going to give back to me as much as I give back to them? Uh, um, probably not. Hmm. There'll be many times that you will give more and you won't get back as much as you thought you, you deserve. But why don't you take fairness out of it? Because you know what? The way of grace is not fair. Hmm. Let me tell you that. You know why it's not fair? Because you get what you don't deserve. <laughs> if you, do you really want what you deserve? Because if you really want what you deserve, well, quite frankly, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> and God will never pay attention to you and he'll never listen to your prayers and he will give you his wrath. That's what you actually deserve. <laughs> but because of Jesus, it was really unfair to him. He got the greatest unfairness of all so that we get the best end of the unfairness, the grace. If you can learn to live in that, then guess what? God is going to, it's strange how it plays out. Maybe the person that you're gracious to today won't be able to give back to you, but it's funny how all these other people in their lives start to pick it up. And then this thing that Jesus is saying, it starts to come true in your life. That's the first one, all right? You want to walk into the heavenly economy. Second one. Um, I want to say, do you want to experience God's abundance? Not just the earthly abundance, but God's abundance. So this is how um, it said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which is a very, that, that chapter, is, it's about money, okay? There's no beating around the bush. It's about giving. It's about money. So here's how he puts it. This is the way it's put in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from the Apostle Paul. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Sounds a lot like Luke 6, isn't it? Because it's pretty much the same thing, all right? Verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So you see notice I highlighted that. Do you want that in your life? God is able to make all grace, not just monetary grace, but all grace. Do you want more love and more forgiveness and more hope in your life? Well, it has something to do with how you think about treasure. It's connected. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, 
you may abound in every great good work. I love that verse. Don't you love that? All sufficiency in all things at all times you will abound. Don't you like that promise? Verse 9. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now pay attention. Verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. He will multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So God, I just want a really big house and I always really wanted to drive a Ferrari because, you know, I just want to drive a Ferrari. Why would God want to give you that? Because, you know, that just makes us selfish and prideful and it's all about me and like, you know, glorify me because I'm driving the hottest car there is. I mean, today would, okay, probably not a Ferrari, maybe for be a Tesla because, you know, we're, we're, we're so hip in Silicon Valley, it'll be a Tesla. But, but what if God says, what if you want to grow in your righteousness, in the seed of your harvest? You want to grow in eternal reward. That God wants to multiply. God wants to grow your heart. God wants to grow love in your heart. God wants to grow grace in your heart. God wants to grow mercy in your heart. God wants you to live radically in the unfairness of grace. Forget about fairness. Who cares about fairness? Because we live far beyond fairness. We're living in grace. So once you want to do that, God wants to do what? He wants to supply it, multiply it, make it bigger. Do you want to taste that? And we're not necessarily talking about money here, but we're talking about your heart, your righteousness, your heavenly rewards. So verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. <laughs> Do you want that? You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I hope that's the way you want to live. So the first one, do you want to taste what it's like, you know, when, when good measure pressed down, running over, when it's coming toward you? Do you want to see what it's like when you want to do something for the Lord and then he makes it bigger? <laughs> you want more riches in Christ and then he will say, great, I'll, I'll, let me multiply that by like, you know, tenfold. Do you want to taste that? I hope that that's something you will want to taste. And in this life, in this life, before you get to heaven, you'll get to taste some of it. <laughs> if you walk down this path toward generous stewardship. Okay? Now let me give you Two more passages um, that we didn't cover last week. So this, here's the next one. So you know, there, these, there's a lot of, in the Bible about money and giving. <laughs> and so I'm kind of blitzing you, but these are huge and incredible passages. So uh, this is 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the, the passage I read to start our service um, today. So this is what it says. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare. You guys know what a snare is? If you want to be rich, you're falling into a trap. That's what the Bible says. That's what God says. Not Su Song, not some guru, not some smart person, God. You're falling into a trap. Into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's where it goes. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So that's the right tr translation. In the, the old King James says the love of money is the root of all evil. No, it's the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Let me just stop for a moment. If you want to go rich and you're just, your fixation is constantly on like, Grow my money, grow my money, grow my you know, earthly treasure. You're going to do something to yourself because that's what the Bible says. You will pierce yourself with many pain. It's you. <laughs> you're actually harming and cursing yourselves and you're like, what's a pang? Pierce themselves. You're piercing yourself. A pang is a wave of pain. <laughs> a pang is a wave of pain. So you are actually inflicting on yourself you're piercing yourself with waves of pain in your life. And of course, that's why you end up in ruin and destruction. And it's coming from you. So let me, let me get into this next point. What is a, a third good reason why you want to get into generous, um, why you want to get into generous stewardship? 
And that is, well, save yourselves from destruction. Hmm. Save yourself from yourself, okay? Save yourself from destroying yourself, from piercing yourself. This is a really good reason. Because I'm, a number of you, if you've been in our church, you've heard me say this. If you have a king in your life, you're like, I don't have any king in my life. Nobody tells me what to do. That means you're your own king. <laughs> you have a very bad king. And if you're your own king, you're, you know, you think you're the boss and you're going to control yourself, but there's probably going to be this thing out there called money and it will control you. So then you think you're in control, but actually it owns you. And then that's when you pierce yourself with many pangs and lead yourself into destruction because you're a very bad king. That's how it works. And our city's filled with people like this. And you know many people I mean, you just, it doesn't say take you very long. Just think of your fir- one friend, two, and you get to like your third friend. Oh, they're, yeah, they're destroying themselves over money, right? Over greed. They wreck their relationships. You know how many, how many divorces happen over money? Because it's like competing idolatries. And then husband wants this, wife wants this. And then like she wants to spend money here and he wants to spend money here. And then they get angry about this. She doesn't want to spend money at all because you know where she wants to spend her money? And she wants to spend her money on security, Oh, security. Those are people that don't spend their money. No, no, you, just, you do spend your money. You're spending it on security because that's your God, right? And so do you want freedom from these kinds of things? It, you have to walk into the pathway of obedience. And it's a reward that comes from trusting. So let's go on. 11, verse 11. As for you, O man or woman of God, Flee these things. There's other things to pursue, better things to pursue. Pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith and take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. You can grab eternal life. You can grab heavenly life, not earthly life. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. That's another thing it'll save you from, from pride. Because that's, everybody who ends up with money, that's just everybody, but 99.9%, we become prideful. And we look down on people who have less than us because, hey, I earned this, didn't I? But you didn't. Probably you didn't. It was probably grace to you. Or do not set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They, that is the rich of this present age, are to do good, to be rich in good works. And here we are, to be generous and ready to share, not from Susang, from God. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may, mo- they may take hold of that which is truly life. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? Matthew chapter six, store up for yourselves treasure, things that are heavenly. There we go again. First Timothy chapter six, Matthew chapter six, Almost the same thing. So, heavenly economy, the abundance of God toward your heart and your heavenly rewards. Three, save yourselves from destruction and from the snare and traps of the idolatries of your heart. And number four, how about this one? So this will take us to our text. Let's go to verse 25 of our text of today. This is great. Do you want to be free of anxiety and of fear and worry? This is how. So he says to you how you do this. So verses 19 and 24 is about give and be generous to the, be, give and be generous and, and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then we get to verse 25. Now it's verse, it's the same, same topic. We're still talking about earthly goods and money. Therefore, Verse 24, you cannot serve God and money. You can't have two masters because if you love money, you will pierce yourself with many pangs. You cannot have God and money. And then now, therefore, verse 25, here's the words of Jesus. I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Oh, I know that. Do you? Do you? All our time is like spent on what clothes we're going to get, what food we're going to eat. I mean, San Jose is a, is a pretty good restaurant town. 
That's a lot of conversation. What do you want to eat today? What do you want to eat today? We'll look at Yelp today, all right? I mean, I look at Yelp probably like, like this one of my most common apps. You know, is life really more than food and clothing? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They don't work at 8 a.m., drive one and a half hours to work really hard to make a lot of money. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. And here's the, here is something I really want you to think about. Aren't you more valuable than them? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Let me say it a little bit differently. Which of you by worrying could get a little bit more money? <laughs> you worry and worry and worry more about it, you'll become richer? N not really. You're just going to you know, just lose sleep. Make yourself stressed. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not clothe you? <laughs> oh, you of little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? How am I going to buy that another car? How am I going to pay off the mortgage? <laughs> How am I going to get a mortgage? I, you know, some of you, you, you just badly want a guy to get out of rent so you can be enslaved by the bank. Don't be so in, in a hurry, okay? <laughs> all right? In, in Silicon Valley, you know, like, just maybe just rent is okay, all right? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. For the people who don't know God seek after all these things. And your father knows you need them. He knows. And here's the verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. And then he'll give these things to you. <laughs> Do you trust that? Do you trust that? Do you want to be free of anxiety? You know, we think, well, then, Lord, can you just put some more money in my bank and then I'll have less anxiety? Maybe he's like saying, maybe, well, maybe you don't need that car. Maybe you don't need to be fixated on, maybe you can rent. I mean, your life is only 80, 90, or 100 years. Maybe you should just suck more money <laughs> into your retirement. I don't know. I mean, uh, can you, today, just worry about things of today. Now I want to close by asking you this question. Of what value are you? Of what value are you? This is why we, we, we got to get more money, we got to get a better job title, got to get a better job title, then we'll make more money, and then when we make more money, then I'll get to move from this neighborhood to that, I'll get to move from this apartment to that house. Then, you know, we never actually say it this way, but you know what we're saying? We actually felt like we went from like a lower valuation to a higher value in life. Right? You used to drive a beat up Honda Civic, but now we're getting to driving a little nicer car and we think, oh, it's not just a nice, you're like, we say, oh, well, you know, it gives me a better gas mileage. P.S. That's not why you bought that car. <laughs> that's not why you bought that car. You know why you bought that car? Because it makes you feel like you are more valued. And in the world, this is how we do it. Do you have more money? Well, the, because if you have more money, that means you must have been smarter and somebody thought you must have been worth something and then they gave you more money and then we get to prove it all the time by where we, the way we dress, what we drive, where we live, where we shop. That's how we do it. All of those are clothing ourselves with our world's value. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. Jesus says, you got these, uh, uh, these, the lilies of the field, they're clothed better than you. <laughs> and they didn't work. What clothing do you really, really need to be really, really valued? That's the question I want to ask you today. Are you going to get your value by shopping at Macy's and not Target? Or Nordstrom and not Macy's? Or I don't, I don't I'm, I've never shopped at the next door level up, so... Because <laughs> some of you have shopped at that next door. I don't know what the next one is, okay? Or by driving a Tesla instead of driving a BMW, instead of driving a BMW, instead of driving a Honda, whatever. 
All of those are trying to clothe ourselves with greater value. But really, isn't that just the world enslaving us? Because at the end of the day, your Tesla's going to go to the junkyard. And nobody's going to care. You know, when you die at your obituary, nobody's going to say, oh man, John, he drove a Tesla. <laughs> man, he was great. He drove a Tesla. <laughs> nobody's going to say that. <laughs> you know why? Because it's really stupid. And honestly, it's worthless. And yet every day, that's what we wake up to do. And yet Jesus says, don't do that. I mean, he didn't just say don't do that because that would be like a legalism. He gives us a better word. There is a value you can have that can never be taken away. We wake up every day and we're like, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not strong enough. I don't have a good enough job title and man, if I, I'd, I'd be more, I, I wish I wasn't such a loser because then we'd just be renting all the time. All right, whatever. If I could just provide this for my kid, then have better value. Well, how about just hanging out with your kid at McDonald's and loving him? I bet you that's what your kid would want more than some stuff, right? But the only way we can get this is if you really begin to believe that first there was one who was infinitely rich. And he looked at us and said, these poor, sad, horrible people, oppressed by the devil and piercing themselves with many pangs, let me go give them a value that they can never lose. So he came and he made himself dirt poor. We're clothed because he was stripped naked. We're always afraid we're going to be rejected, but he went before the most important person there is, and there could ever be, God. And he was rejected because he took upon all our shame and all our poverty and all our wickedness and all the ways that we pierce ourselves with many pangs. And then he forgave us, and then he washed us, and he clothed us with his riches, with his name, with his acceptance with all his promises. And if you could live inside of that, then money can just be money. <laughs> because you'll have a much greater clothing. Can you believe that you have far more worth to God? And he proved it by paying with his son. Can you believe that? And if you can wake up each day tomorrow and think about your money and remember that, then you could become free and you can live in the heavenly economy, and you can become a more beautiful and glorious human being, a more joyous human being. Brothers and sisters, live in the gospel. Live in your promises that are given to you by the one who made himself poor and naked so he can clothe you with far better than clothes from Nordstrom. <laughs> he can clothe you with his honor and his riches forever. Let's pray. Lord, we um, seek after dumb mud pies. We're like people who um, are hoarding up Confederate money. It's like the Civil War is going to be over soon, but man, we got to love that Confederate money. But help us to remember the truth. Help us to take some steps like our brother Glenn and make revive a church radically free because we know our value. Nobody can take away our value. And we cannot add to our value through money, but we can store up riches from you by living in you and having the consummation of our obedience and our trust in you. Make us a really, really heavenly rich church. Make us really rich people in you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.